Um, so as Peter mentioned, um, I'm the program manager for the DH Lab, and one of the things that I think a lot about is how do we help students and faculty who are interested in digital humanities methods get started? Oftentimes, computation is a new dimension to their work. They might not have experience, oftentimes they won't have experience in programming. They might or might not know what the file system is on their computer. Um, and they all have different time frames in which they're working in which they need to complete a project. Depending what they're hoping to do, that poses more or less of a problem. If they're interested in getting started with text analysis, there are a lot of really out of the box tools, no programming required to get started, um, oftentimes as an entry into later more sophisticated methods. But if they're interested in image analysis, it tends to be a little bit steeper of a curve. Uh, the approaches tend to be really technically and mathematically sophisticated. They're oftentimes working with thousands, or the algorithms are primed for working with thousands or tens of thousands of images, as we've seen earlier. And the students and faculty who are coming to me usually aren't working quite at that scale, but they are interested in these approaches. And so how can they actually get started? And as Peter mentioned, uh, one of the reasons this has been on our mind lately, especially in the image computation space, is we did have a student come to us last semester. She's a master's student in sculpture, and she was interested in working with this collection of photographs of paintings that she has, around 65 photographs um, of an artist that she was close with. And she wanted to know whether she could take those photographs of these paintings and create new images that would be in the style of those photographs so that they would look like that artist had created them, even though he hadn't. For her, this was both an artistic project. Um, it was something she was thinking about as part of her program. It was a research project, but it was also very personal to her. Um, this artist that she was working with um, was a very close friend and is deceased, and so it's a sort of a fixed collection, and she was really uh, very motivated and, and invested in working on this project. And she had seen, um, some of you might have seen, that Christie's recently sold an artwork for almost half a million dollars um, that was produced with a GAN. So some of the things that Peter was showing us earlier, um, we really as a lab should be producing GANs, I think, for Christie's. Um, but she was really excited by this approach and saw that it seemed like something that is kind of what she was hoping to do. But the problem is, is GANs do require you to have thousands and tens of thousands of images, and she had around 65. So that wasn't going to quite be an approach that she could use, and she herself had no programming experience, so that was also going to be a bit of a barrier. So we wanted to find something that could at least get her started in thinking along these um, computational lines that could be a first pass for this project. And so neural style transfer was the approach that we decided we would take. Um, this is where you are combining the content of one image with the style of another image by way of convolutional neural networks. And we were going to use the code base that's produced um, by Justin Johnson. There's his GitHub link, and I'll post the link again later um, if you're interested in it. And there were several advantages, we thought, to using this approach. Um, it works on a small scale, so it can work with just two images, um, though it can work with more than two, as we'll see in a few minutes. After the initial setup, it only requires a few lines of code to run. And so this meant that after a session on the Unix shell, the student would be able to run this code on her own. She'd be able to change some of the parameters to tweak the output, so she wouldn't be dependent on us to run the algorithm and make changes and our best guesses, she would actually be able to get her hands on the code and make some slight adjustments here or there um, based on what she was seeing as the output. And this also, the ability to kind of tweak um, the parameters incrementally also meant that she could get a little bit of experience working with the code and trying to figure out what it's actually doing so that she could see a little bit behind the scenes. One challenge that we had to be mindful of, though, was the filter effect. So as the name neural style transfer suggests, what the algorithm's trying to do is grab the content from the content image, take the style from the style image, and generate a new output image that has the content of one with the style of the other. Um, but that's not exactly what our student wanted to do. Um, she didn't just want the style of this painting, um, or her artist's paintings. She also wanted content that felt new and generated as well. And so even though it's neural style transfer, algorithm, we were trying to think, is this still an approach that we could use to get something that feels really generative, even on the content side as well? And so what we did is I'm going to show you um, a few experiments that I ran while we were just trying to get our footing with what this algorithm was capable of. Um, and then we taught her how to do this as well, and so that she could experiment with her own data set. But instead of showing um, her data set, I'm going to show some Kandinsky paintings um, instead. So for the first experiment um, that we ran, we just did the defaults. So we took one Kandinsky painting, we took another Kandinsky painting, and we produced a third. 
And as you can see, we have, yes, like we have the style of that second one. Um, we have the colors of that second one, but we still have all the main core content from that first original image. And this again, because we haven't changed any of the default parameters at this point. But what we could start doing is you can have more than one style if you want it. And so in this case, we're taking now four Kandinsky paintings as our style input. And by default, all of those style images are equally weighted, but you can adjust that, which is something um, we'll get to. And so what you're seeing is, yes, we're starting to see a little bit more variation now in terms of the final output color. It's starting to look a little different, but that content is still really the same content. And so the next step is the one that I think starts being promising for what the student was hoping to do, which is that you can also adjust the weights. So you can have the trade-off between the relative weights of how much you retain of that content image and how much you are taking from the style images. Changing the weights um, will result in higher loss for each of those epics. We were just hearing about epics. Um, but as a result of that, you start to see greater change with each iteration. And so you start to get something that feels a little more transformative. And so after that point, after you're mixing up the styles and the weights, really it's just a matter of keep tweaking it. Try different weight settings and see which one starts to feel more in line with what you're hoping to see. Um, I rather like actually the third one. I think that looks like a nice Kandinsky painting, even though it's um, not exactly. But what else you could do is you could also take from an earlier output in that epic if you were interested. So this is um, gonna cycle through each 100 epics. It uh, gives you an output image. And so again, depending what the goal is for the project, you could take from one of those earlier stages um, and have that be an image that you wanna work with. Or the last thing that I'll show is you could take the output and use that as your new content image. So um, now we have an output, which is already kind of a mixed up one, has a lot of things going on with it. And then we're adding three more style images to that. And then the result feels, again, that much more transformative now um, because we suddenly don't have a content image that um, already had a firm content um, attached to it. And so I'm gonna take that last one now and put it actually in the context of a bunch of Kandinsky paintings. And you can see that it really does start to have the feel of Kandinsky without having the exact content copied from any single one of those. And so this was something um, that was really exciting to the student that we were working with. We were able to get her set up on the computer in the cube actually is where she did a lot of this work. Um, so she had a key to the cube. She was able to come in anytime Sterling was open, run these algorithms on her own with her own data set. She could try switching out um, paintings because some images work better as content images than others. Some work better as style images than others. And she also, um, is starting to think about how she might expand her corpus even more to inc include things like um, some of the photographs that the artist took that inspired the paintings he then went on to do. And so mixing some of those actual source photographs with the actual photographs themselves to produce something new. But other ways that you could tweak the parameters um, that I haven't shown are you could do things like rotating the style image would have an effect on this. You could um, choose how much of the color you're taking from the content image or not. You could resize the style images so the code is actually really flexible um, and has a lot of different parameters that you might play around with. And so for anyone who's interested um, in getting something up and running or for more of the technical back end of it and is really interested in the fact that we ran this with CUDA and Torch and on a GPU instead of a CPU, um, I recommend checking out the code on GitHub. It's all open. And then this is the paper that inspired the code. Um, so for anyone who's interested in exploring with that, thank you. Thank you.